This is Elizabeth Melton. I'm the Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I am conducting interviews with the Loose Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. I am here with Marcial Godoy, and we are meeting via Zoom. Today is Friday, February 9th, 2024. Uh, Marcial, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, hello, Elizabeth. Uh, my name is Marcel Godoy. I am the Managing Director of the Hemispheric Institute, and I was one of the principal investigators of our loose-funded initiative, uh, which had the name uh, Local Ecologies of Migrant Care, Rapid Responses to COVID-19. And it is a pleasure to be here and talk about this experience, which is ongoing uh, in a way, but of the work that we were able to do uh, during the pandemic, which was very, very important, both to us and to our partners. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, if you'll take me back a little bit in time to the start of this project, can you tell me a little bit about the story of your project and how it came to be? Right. Um, well, uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, the Hemispheric Institute had been working closely uh, with migrant communities across the hemisphere. Uh, part of that work was supported by the Luce Foundation. Uh, uh, we were looking at the role of religious actors in migrant solidarities uh, uh, from Central America all the way up the migrant trail. And we did extensive documentation, um, again, in Central America, Mexico, the, the both borders, the southern Mexican border and the border with the United States. And um, we put together uh, basically an archive, a research archive, uh, during that work that also included uh, many partners locally, uh, churches, uh, uh, immigrant leaders, immigrant organizations, people who were mobilizing to respond to the, sort of the ongoing emergencies that migrants were facing uh, both in, across the hemisphere but also locally in New York City. Uh, you might remember that the, these were the times of uh, the Trump administration. What that looked like on the ground in New York were the beginning of raids of migrant homes in the mornings. There were all of these emergency response networks that sprouted up uh, amongst our communities uh, to respond to uh, the ways in which uh, immigration policy was looking like on the grounds in places like Sunset Park, in places like East Harlem, where you had uh, people's homes being raided at six o'clock in the morning and you had groups that mobilized people to go and witness and, and be present you know, when that was happening. So there was a lot of organization prior to the pandemic, as in what I'm trying to kind of describe. So at the moment of the pandemic, these networks that were already in place, that were already activated, immediately turned to respond to uh, the health emergency that all of a sudden we were all facing, but that these migrant communities as frontline workers, the majority of them, uh, were particularly uh, affected by, both in terms of the loss of income and employment, but also in terms of the loss, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the loss of life as a result of the pandemic. Just to give you an example, uh, the zip code in Corona, Queens, which is a heavily migrant neighborhood in Queens, had the highest per capita death rate from COVID in the, first, in the, in the country in the first months of COVID-19. And it's precisely in these neighborhoods, again, that, uh, that the communities that we were involved with and that we mobilized to be able to serve and support, uh, this is exactly where they lived and who they were. And so uh, the Loose Foundation's Emergency COVID-19 Response Program was really an extraordinary opportunity for us to be able to mobilize resources and support to key strategic partners in these communities who we knew from this prior work uh, but who had immediately turned to supporting the very very basic needs of those communities which translated in large part uh, and at the beginning into the provision of food and, the, and taking care of the, the food emergency uh, that struck many families and this is what the work was uh, or how it began at that moment uh, we partnered with four organizations, three of them churches, one a, a, a restaurant kitchen. Uh, the first was the Holyrood uh, 
a Santa Cruz uh, church in Washington Heights, led then by Reverend Luis Barrios. Uh, the second was St. Saint, Saint Peter's Church in, in Manhattan, uh, led by Reverend uh, Fabian, who was an amazing leader and organizer there in his community. Uh, the, the Church of the Good Shepherd, uh, a Lutheran church uh, in, in Bay, uh, Bay Ridge, uh, Brooklyn, uh, led by Pastor Juan Carlos Ruiz. And then the fourth was uh, the La Morada Restaurant and Mutual Aid Kitchen, so like a, a very activist uh, 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 organization that is based in the South Bronx. So these were our four partners. This, these are uh, uh, the, the, the institutions and organizations that we collaborated with and that we were able to mobilize and channel resources, life-saving resources that were provided by this uh, Loose Foundation program so that they could, to support uh, their, um, their, their food distribution programs, which came everything from just kind of simple groceries to hot meals to lunch boxes. Uh, distribution to homes. I mean, there were, you know, La Morada was distributing, uh, you know, kind of lunch, lunches to housing projects in the South Bronx with volunteers. So the, the, the bodies were there to do the work, but the crucial support to be able to have the actual food and other resources to be distributed uh, was a role that we were able to play and that the Luce Foundation and this program in particular had a fundamentally central role in, and to this day, those communities and those the leaders of those organizations and churches are thankful for the support that we were able to give. That's incredible, thank you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced during your project? I'm sure there were manifold, being kind of in that hotbed of, of New York City Absolutely. I mean, the cha I mean, the, the first challenge was again the fear of of, of illness. Um, you know, I think everyone, those of us on our team, we documented, uh, you know, this uh, our work and and the the work that was being done. So everyone that was out doing stuff during this time meant we weren't at home protecting ourselves from the virus. Uh, so there was the challenge of of navigating all of this with masks and care and all of the. Um, you know, all of the, the, the precautions that had to be taken. Um, there were also sort of, sort of, you know, other challenges of how to mobilize uh, and, and support these organizations in their efforts to, to be able to, 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 to mobilize assistance from the city and from other organizations uh, that maybe had more conditions attached to the aid or that needed the, the required advocacy to be able to say, hey, you know, we were able to contribute this much, you know, uh, is how can you, you know, match that or provide more support? So it, the questions of leveraging the support that, that the Luce Foundation made available also was a challenge, but a good challenge to the degree that I think other resources arrived in these communities thanks to this aid and us being able to leverage it. I think that you know on, on the ground in the in the sites at the distribution sites, you can imagine the different challenges faced by the people leading kind of this work. I mean, the the the, inter, the intercultural nature of people that would form in a line right to receive food um, in 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 Bay Ridge, for example, you had incredibly diverse, you know, kind of. Uh, Eastern European seniors with, uh, you know, Arab American and Arab migrants, uh, uh, Mexican and Central American migrants. So you have these wonderful mixes of people, but that w differences developed among them and between them in the process of them participating. And all of that had to be navigated. Uh, and again, these are all good challenges, but in a moment of, of an emergency like that, I think um, they were significant and, uh, and in retrospect, I believe kind of all the communities involved are the richer because of these challenges that had to be navigated, but at the time some difficult circumstances emerged. Yeah, I'm, I can only imagine all the different challenges that you faced. Um, what about a moment when you felt celebratory and like your project was on the right path? When something went right. 
I mean, I think it was uh, most of the work, I think, especially when we from Hemi kind of went out and participated, a lot of us were were kind of doing the work as well, not just when we were documenting. It was just simply kind of seeing, you know, the tons of food being moved out, you know, the doors and being delivered into the hands and homes of the people who needed them. And uh, that in and of itself was really kind of testament, really, to the fact that with this project was on the right track. The aid, the, the help was arriving uh, where it needed to and to the communities and to the families that needed it. The other, I think, kind of even perhaps greater joy was also seeing how the communities themselves uh, mobilized and responded to the emergency and the kind of empowerment and the stepping up of people from these communities into first volunteer roles and then leadership roles and then becoming the people that were kind of running these operations on the ground. We were able to document uh, for example, these uh, testimonies of young women and just many people who, because uh, a, you know a, a lot of employment just shut down, so there were a lot of people who were home, and who first arrived, you know, at these sites to receive food, to receive assistance, and as they returned and as they engaged the people there, they realized that they themselves could play an active role, and over time that they themselves could assume leadership roles. Right, And so there was this empowerment that happened as people saw themselves being capable of responding to uh, this public health emergency and becoming leaders in their community uh, in a way that they never expected or that they never imagined they could. And those, I think, were really sort of kind of great moments. And of course, that kind of building of community leadership, you know, is something that, that stays long after any particular kind of project or initiative ends when you build capacity like that, social, political capacity in communities, that remains in communities and I think it continues to have a positive, a positive effect. Yeah, I love that and that acknowledgement of that type of capacity building. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more as well. You mentioned, you know, the, the Hemi team and all the documenting work that you were doing. Can you can you tell me like what what the day in the life was when that team was on the ground and what y'all were collecting? Yeah. Um, uh, yes. I mean, we would go to the sites, uh, right? So, uh, and this is documented, and you can share uh, in our Ecologies of Migrant Care page. There's a whole section on the interviews and with photographs and footage. Uh, that we kind of collected and edited and published about each of these four sites. Um, and it was, I mean, you know, again, we had one or two people on camera, you know, we would all have our phones and kind of be doing photography and very aware, right, that the, the documentation was part of, of the work we were doing. But when you showed up at a site and it was time to sort of, sort of sort the tomatoes, and, and turn, you know, a kind of a hundred pound bag of rice, you know, into a hundred, into a hundred small bags that then you would put in grocery bags, we had to roll up our sleeves. And so the documentation stopped at the moment that, that we all just had to roll up our sleeves and, and join the efforts to get this food packaged and ready and distributed to people. So a lot of that work, and of course, again, it was a moment of fear around kind of the virus and, and actually, you know, kind of prevention and, and fear around catching, you know, COVID. But it was also a moment in, in which I think, you know, kind of the, the, the work itself really just kind of pulled you forward uh, and made you feel an active participant side to side with people that maybe the week before had just been in line receiving aid this week they were part of the distribution effort and there we were making pound bags of rice out of hundred pound sacks of rice because it's cheaper to buy the big sacks <laughs> and so the, the your your support dollar goes further if you have the volunteers to make it into one pound bags you know that kind of thing and so it was exhilarating and terrifying but really really rewarding Thank you. Can you tell me a bit more, too, about what the project looks like today? I know it's this one portion of it was something of a much larger ongoing project. So what does that look like now? I think the project has, uh, I mean, uh, 
well, a couple of things. We have continued our work on migration as the circumstances have changed, right? Uh, the, the, uh, as the pandemic eased, right, in this new moment, also the, the migrant situation um, in New York City has dramatically shifted, right? So over the past, you know, since the spring of 2020, 150,000 asylum seekers have arrived in New York City, many of them trafficked on buses from the border by, you know, kind of, you know, uh, Republican governors intent on, you know, weaponizing them politically uh, for whatever reasons. So New York has had an influx of 150,000 new neighbors uh, uh, in the last 18 months that ha has been a fundamentally different population than the population that we were serving before. Right, uh, je the the migrants in these communities that were we were working with were from Mexico or from Central America. Uh, they both arrived; they all kind of tended to arrive in the United States undocumented, um, and so there was no claim made for the city to have to house them or feed them. People arrived and were received by networks and kind of absorbed and supported by networks as they got on their feet. This new uh, wave of migrants is completely different it, uh, they, in, in terms of legal status. They arrive with uh, an asylum case which entitles them to, uh, which entitles them to a work permit. Uh, it also kind of entitles them to ask the city for housing. Uh, these are kind of new communities that do not have broad roots of relatives or kin or you know, from their hometowns in Mexico or Central America. So it's a completely different situation. And this, uh, the, the work has continued um, supporting mutual aid, these very networks, and then entirely new ones have sprung up um, to respond to this. So we're still very much in contact with a lot of the people that we work with in this initiative, but the focus has shifted. Now you have, you know, migrants uh, being housed in emergency tent city shelters in, in on city properties, you know, uh, in 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 these kind of terrifying kind of you know sp you know spaces, right? Um, that looked like detention camps. And I was in a refugee camp as a child, so I can tell you they looked they my visit to them felt, you know, like those places feel, um, and so. The mutual aid, the needs, the organization that's required to support these new neighbors, I think is fundamentally different than the ones that were in place and were mobilized during the pandemic. Um, and that's one thing. And then the other part of that answer is really that thanks to the support that you're providing for you know the community engagement work that we're doing now, what we're being able to do with the, the, the four partners in those communities from the COVID period is that uh, in an initiative uh, to engage the communities in reflection uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and to continue some of the work that was begun uh, uh, during uh, uh, this time, uh, we were able to get uh, some resources to do a, a, a community memory activation project called Memories, uh, uh, Memories of COVID-19, Memories of Mutual Aid. Uh, and through photography and through the creation of these kind of very simple clothesline photographic uh, exhibitions, which we're in the process of producing and installing, the idea was to go back to these four sites, put up ex uh, uh, kind of temporary exhibitions um, uh, of photographs from that period where a lot of those same volunteers from all of these different places are visible in the photographs. Um, uh, it's being curated by Cynthia Santos Briones, who's a, a, a wonderful photographer, curator, colleague. Um, and, uh, and so what we're doing is putting up these exhibitions and then having small community assemblies a couple of weeks later, is the plan, so that people can come together and in relation to the photographs, really speak about that period, right? And because what we want to activate is people's you know, uh, sense of capacity and sense of uh, uh, of strength, right, in the face of an emergency like COVID-19. People did mobilize and people did join these efforts. And as I was saying earlier, many people assumed roles that in in in, in their communities that they would have they had never assumed before. So we're using photography 
uh, to to kind of activate those memories and activate conversation in those communities uh, in order to strengthen and empower them and make sure that they don't forget what they were capable of in a moment of emergency. So that's where the, the work is now. That's wonderful. I always think it's so important to find those kind of creative spaces um, to, to process this kind of work. And I know that that's a big um, goal for Hemi as well. Yeah, absolutely. Performance kind of background and connection. Um, absolutely. So thinking more along the lines of um, the relationships, the capacity building you've been doing um, alongside these communities, what types of advice would you have for other scholars or communities who would be looking to do this kind of work? I mean, uh, I, my sense is, and, I, and I'm sure this is something that all of our colleagues who I've met in this project over the years kind of know well, uh, but it's really to, to sort of engage in the work uh, directly. In other words, you might be there to document, just to give an example, but the moment comes when clearly you just have to put your, your instruments down and you have to roll up your sleeves and engage in the collective efforts uh, that the communities themselves are engaging in. And I think, kind of as a methodology, I think this not only enriches um, kind of any, a, 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 you know, any, any kind of data or research that you might produce, but it enriches your kind of perspectives as a researcher, as, a, as an activist. It enhances the kind of networks and the strength of the networks that, that institutions like HEMI and others can build over time. It creates durable kind of bonds of, of collaboration and trust with leaders and others in communities that you can reactivate in the future in circumstances that you don't yet know are to come. Um, and I think, for example, I mean, in a, in a sort of doomsday scenario, were we to face a second Trump administration, and all of us remember the one before, where we were kind of going to the aid of families at 6.30 in the morning that were having their doors, you know, banged down by, by, by you know, immigration officers sent by the federal government, we don't know what's coming. Uh, and so the strength of, of, of networks, the strength of, of, the, of our ties to community that is built in these different iterations in different moments in time doing this work is cumulative. And if you're, um, if you're intentional about kind of building that and doing things in ways that strengthen that, that puts you in, in ever better positions to face whatever might be next. And we don't know what might be next, but there are some scenarios that suggest that what might be next might be worse than what came before. And so we are happy, I'm not happy, but we are, we are in, a, in a good position to, to confront whatever comes next uh, with these communities and as we respond to needs or assault or whatever is coming down the pipeline. Yeah, I can tell that you really have an, an ongoing and a real commitment to a sustainable relationship with that, the communities that you've been working with. That's right. Yeah, I mean, that's the idea because it's the only way to build. I mean, it, it's thinking about it, it, it as movement building and what we do as a research institution and from a university as we engage communities in different moments and in different ways. We never stop being a research institute in a university and, and however, and we are fortunate that to, on, on occasion we're able to access resources that other, you know, that others are, might not have access to. But all in all, and over time, you know, it is building. It it, it is kind of loosely building, a, you know, uh, the relationships that constitute a movement and organ collective organizations of people and networks that can respond to situations as they present themselves. And the idea is to strengthen them intentionally as you do the things you do, because that will yield dividends both for yourself as a research institution, but also for the communities that you're a part of in the future. Absolutely, I love that. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time here, so I wanna give you space that if there's anything else that you'd really like uh, to speak about this project, you know, this you can think of this too as 
part of going into an archive, being part of that documentation process mm -hmm. for future generations, right, to reflect on this. Yeah. Um, so what else would you like to add? Um, there's something that kind of struck me both in kind of in this project and in the ongoing relationships we've had with, uh, with uh, leaders and, uh, in, you know, in migrant organizations and migrant communities. And it's the sheer courage of some of the most vulnerable people uh, that are part of the, the, the communities that we're part of, uh, and particularly women, uh, uh, migrant women, who assume roles of leadership who are themselves undocumented. So just even the sense of, of the positions that you put yourself in knowing that any kind of thing can go wrong, that you are showing up you know, and, and putting your body along with the bodies of others between a family and, and INS, or, you know, kind of reaching out and speaking publicly during the COVID epidemic about the needs of communities and just being a public person with the enormous courage uh, while being undocumented uh, and with the kind of differential risks that that, po that, that, that poses to to you and to your families if that's kind of your positioning. I've seen that repeatedly and so I think kind of just I guess I would want to comment on that and put that on the record. Uh, the, enormous, the enormous courage of um, documented migrant women that we have witnessed and we have had the privilege to work next to and that I have the privilege of calling my friends thanks to now years of ongoing work. Uh, is something that is absolutely notable and exceptional. Um, and for me, that's one of the biggest kind of takeaways of doing this work. Yeah, the risks um, of speaking up and advocating in that kind of very complex high risk space. Absolutely. Um, is very powerful. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we're coming to the end of our time. Thank you so much for um, speaking with me today. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for the opportunity. I can't wait to see the, the, the entire collection and see how, how all of our voices kind of, you know, kind of sit next to one another and contribute to a greater whole. I think it's been a privilege to be part of this uh, uh, collective of, of, of loose grantees uh, of this particular program. Um, and I look forward to being able to continue uh, being a part and, and, and being uh, uh, involved in, in, in what comes next.